special guest, special friend of uh, CPC, um, frequent contributor. Um, unfortunately, there's always a crisis in the world and uh, it's always good for us to get the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sage advice and, 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 and excellent presentation of Steve Biddle, who formerly is a uh, professor of international and public affairs at Columbia adjunct senior fellow for defense policy, Council on Foreign Relations, Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia. But best of all, he's a friend of CPC. And we welcome you this morning, Steve. Thank you so much for giving your time. One oh. reminder to everybody in the house, he can't hear you unless you get a mic from Joe or a mic from Mike. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Sure. Thank, thanks for having me back. I, I get frequent flyer miles at Christ Presbyterian. If, after I give you know, 15 talks, and I get to come to the service for free. Uh, so it's always a pleasure to, to be back uh, with our friends at Christ Presbyterian. So uh, will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, you call on us to follow your will in the world and not just in church on Sunday mornings. Grant us the wisdom to see your will for us in the complicated world of international politics and the courage to follow it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the, uh, the topic for this morning is Ukraine. As always, there's a lot going on in the world, but Ukraine seems particularly worth uh, talking about. Um, what I thought I would do uh, with the subject is spend a little bit of time on the, the Christian ethics of the war, given that this is, after all, a Sunday school class. And I, I know with this group, we've talked about the Christian ethics of war and peace in the past, so this will be a review, but it's been a while and, and the, the ethics of this are consequential. So I'll, I'll start by just kind of briefly reminding us of the, the principles of, of the just war tradition and Christian ethics and how they apply in this war. I'll spend a little more time talking about the conduct of the war to date, and then I'll segue into the prospects for termination uh, of the war uh, and what that means and what that requires. But before I do any of that, it, it seems like it makes sense to start with at least a little bit of brief background on the history of the conflict and how we got to where we are, where, where in the heck did this war come from? Um, what are the roots and the causes of it? Because that influences especially the, the ethical considerations involved in the US uh, engagement with the war. So why don't we, why don't we start uh, with a little bit of the history? So uh, when the Cold War ended, uh, the Soviet Union broke up uh, and the Soviet empire, what was then called the, the Warsaw Pact and the tre Warsaw Treaty Organization that underlay it broke up. And when that happened, a variety of political entities that were formerly republics of the old Soviet Union became independent states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithu Lithuania, Kyrgyzstan, uh, and Ukraine, uh, all formerly part of the Soviet Union, now with the end of the Cold War, independent countries. And the Soviet allies in Eastern Europe that were bound to the Soviet Union by the Warsaw Treaty then became free actors, Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, Romania, the eastern part of Germany, and were free to align as they wished. Um, as the Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire broke up, a lot of people were expecting that the NATO alliance would then break up. After all, the, the purpose of the NATO alliance at its founding was to balance against the Soviet superpower. There was no more Soviet superpower. Why then do we need NATO? And so there was a considerable expectation that NATO would just go away now that its reason for being went away. Uh, in fact, obviously it did not, and it did not for several reasons. One is the old Soviet allies uh, of the Warsaw Treaty Organization and many of the former republics of the old Soviet Union were frightened that although the rump of the old Soviet Union that is now the Russian Federation was radically weaker than the old Soviet Union, that would not always be so. And at some point in the future, so reasoned states like Poland um, or states like Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia reasoned that at some point in the future, a stronger Russia may decide to reassemble 
the old Soviet Union and the old Soviet empire, and it would come for them. And they wanted protection from the stronger powers of the West to prevent this from happening. So there was a substantial enthusiasm in the old Soviet empire and the, Republic, the newly independent republics of the old Soviet Union for retaining NATO and expanding it to include them. There was also a view on the part of NATO's members that the prospect of NATO membership among a collection of states that clearly wanted it would be a useful lever to encourage democratic and economic reform in these formerly Soviet, formerly Soviet imperial states. So the idea on the part of a lot of uh, actors in NATO was let's conditionally offer NATO membership to people like Poland or to people like Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania and others if they agree to democratize, if they agree to reform their economies, if they agree to reduce corruption, if they agree to stop participating in internal violent conflicts within their borders. So th this prospect of joining the alliance in the future was seen as a lever for improving politics in much of the continent of Europe. And between these two incentives, fear on the part of the new members and hope on the part of the old members, the result was that NATO did not go away. In fact, it expanded. NATO, when the Cold War ended, had 16 members. NATO today has 30 members, many of which are coming from the old Soviet empire and, and satellite system. Um, for all of this period, Russia was not a big fan of NATO expansion, right? If, if, if you ask any Russian and especially uh, Russian presidents, uh, do you favor or oppose NATO expansion? The answer would always have been, we oppose it. But for most of this period, it was not a big thundering massive deal. I mean, strangely enough, in today, looking at the current quality of US-Russian relations, for most of the post-Cold War era, US-Russian relations were actually pretty good, in spite of the fact that NATO was expanding more or less through this period. So for example, after the Cold War ended, the US and Russia signed a new arms control treaty, New START, signed and ratified. Uh, the US, the, the Russian Republic, Russian Federation voted to support US sanctions against Iran. Uh, the United States supported Russia's entry into the World Trade Organization. Russia agreed to build a supply route through Russia by which American supplies and arms could be sent into Afghanistan. It's called the Northern Distribution Network. And you know, by the end of the Obama administration, that Northern supply, military supply route from Western Europe through Russia into Afghanistan was supplying a sizable fraction of all the munitions and supplies that US forces were consuming in Afghanistan. The US and Russia liberalized visa requirements throughout this period. In fact, in 2010, polling suggested that 60% of Russians held a favorable view of the United States, even as NATO was expanding. Right? So, what then happened to go from a situation where 60% of Russians had a favorable view of the United States and US-Russian relationships were basically quite good to a situation like we have today in which the United States is sending uh, you know, military and economic assistance to a Russian opponent in war at the tune of about 25 billion a month. Um, the issue was not primarily NATO expansion never popular, but not decisive. What was decisive was a change in Russian internal politics. Uh, Vladimir Putin had been Russian president. Um, he then stepped down and was replaced by his uh, subordinate uh, Medvedev. But then in 2012, Putin returned to the presidency in Russia and he returned to the presidency in Russia in a condition of tremendous political upheaval within Russia. The 2011 Russian parliamentary elections had been uh, riven by fraud uh, and was in the view of the majority of Russians an illegitimate election in which Putin's allies had stuffed ballot boxes and suppressed political opposition to ensure that Putin and his allies would return to power. 
And the result of this widespread political upset in Russia over the decay of democracy represented by a highly fraudulent, fraudulent election was massive protests in 2011 uh, demanding true democracy in Russia. And Putin interpreted this as a very direct threat, that this was directed implicitly and explicitly at his return to office in an attempt to prevent that. Moreover, the United States backed the protesters, as the United States often does in these kinds of what are sometimes called color revolutions, these kind of popular uprisings against autocratic government, the United States typically, and especially so since 2001, sides with the pro-democracy protesters over the autocratic governments that they're protesting against. And the US government, the Obama administration, pretty explicitly sided with the protesters. And in particular, the State Department under Hillary Clinton very vocally sided with the protesters. And Putin, who viewed these protests as a direct and existential threat to himself, as he was returning to power, then came to the clear belief that A, democracy movements of the kind that had taken root in a variety of the newly independent non-Soviet empire, uh, former Soviet satellites of the East, uh, and as the United States was advocating, was a direct threat to himself. And so he became much more hostile to the spread of democratic integration in the former Soviet empire, very hostile towards the United States, which he now viewed as a direct implacable threat and enemy. And that combined with Putin's own personal political brand and his own personal political commitments, which is to a much greater degree than Medvedev, and certainly though to a vastly greater degree than people like uh, you know, Gorbachev or Yeltsin that preceded Putin's first term in office, Putin was a believer in the old Soviet Union. He's a former KGB officer, a former intelligent agent and intelligence agent in the old Soviet empire. And you know, very much felt that Russia deserved to return to its former status and saw his presidency as a vehicle for doing this. Combine and moreover saw his you know, political calling card in Russia relative to his opponents as his reputation as a strong man who will return Russia to its former glories. You take that political agenda, combine it with the degree of perceived threat to himself and his agenda in the form of American you know, allied protest movements in favor of democracy and against him. And the result was a pretty dramatic change in Russian foreign policy. Um, so as that was happening, then we have a variety of events going on in Ukraine. So. Uh, Ukraine, like a number of former Soviet allies and former Soviet republics, looks at two kind of alternative futures, one in which you reintegrate with Russia into something like the old Soviet Union, and you have a future of bread lines. I mean, the, the old Soviet Union doesn't look that attractive, right? If, if you happen to be somebody other than Vladimir Putin and other than you know, an acolyte of, of his agenda for Russia. So like a lot of former Soviet satellites and former Soviet Republic, Ukraine is, is gravitationally attracted to the West, politically, but also economically. Um, Ukraine, unlike some former Soviet republics and some former satellites, is not immediately granted NATO membership. In 2008, NATO promises sometime in the future that it'll admit Ukraine, uh, but it doesn't do it initially. On the other hand, Ukraine is busily trying to integrate economically with the West. And in particular, uh, a, a negotiated agreement had been reached with the European Union, not NATO, the European Union, in which Ukraine pledged a variety of reforms and changes in the structure of its economy and its accounting system and its transparency to enable it to integrate more effectively with the European Union. Uh, 
Putin now increasingly views this kind of agenda as a threat. Maybe because Ukraine would someday be a NATO member and NATO would you know, push military forces forward into Ukraine and perhaps invade Russia, but probably not. Mostly what Putin is afraid of with respect to Ukraine is that Ukraine will integrate with the West economically and politically and will join with the former Soviet republics in the Baltics and elsewhere as an illustrative example of what you can do if you get rid of authoritarian autocrats like Vladimir Putin. You get prosperity, you get democratic free expression, you get you know, popular enthusiasm for an anti-autocratic project. All of this looked like not the sort of example that Vladimir Putin wanted existing right on his Western border of all the swell things that could happen if you get rid of Vladimir Putin in Moscow. So the result of this is that Putin intervenes politically in Ukraine in 2013 and encourages uh, the then president of Ukraine uh, to welch on this deal and to back out of this agreement that Ukraine had already reached with the EU, not for full membership, but for a degree of increasing association with, with the EU. And the result of this was a massive uproar in Ukraine. The majority, there's a significant Russian minority in Ukraine, especially there was back in 2013. They were eh, not sure they liked this, this business of Western integration, but the majority of Ukrainians were absolutely behind it, wanted integration with the West. And when they saw the president of Ukraine uh, backing away from this, the result were massive protests uh, in what were called the, the Euromaidan protest. Maidan Square translates to Independence Square. It's a physical location in the heart of, of Kyiv, the Ukrainian capital. These Euromaidan protests named for the square in Ukraine where it all happened, uh, immediately became a powerful threat to the existing Ukrainian government and especially a powerful threat to its relationship with Russia. And Russia pressured uh, the president of Ukraine to put them down violently, uh, which Viktor Yanukovych, then president of Ukraine, agreed to do. And the result of this upset at what Yanukovych was doing, pulling Ukraine back from the West, and Yanukovych's heavy-handed iron fist suppression of these protests resulted in a massive escalation of the protests to the point where it became increasingly a worrisome prospect that there was gonna be a popular uprising that would overthrow the government in Ukraine. As all this happened, of course, Putin is tearing his hair out. This is exactly the opposite of what he wants to happen in Ukraine. Um, moreover, the Ukrainian parliament is getting really nervous because they don't want a popular uprising that throws out the government, including them. The result is parliament in a non-constitutional you know, act votes out Yanukovych outside of an election. So through non-constitutional means, Yanukovych is voted out. The Ukrainian parliament overwhelmingly votes to get rid of the guy. Putin views this as a coup d'etat. Right? The Ukrainian parliament has risen up and thrown out my ally in Kyiv. Putin is immensely pissed. Yanukovych is none too pleased with this. The part of Ukraine that is Russian speaking, ethnically Russian and predisposed to a close relationship with Russia isn't very happy with what's going on. And in the midst of all that, Putin decides, uh, I'm gonna put the kibosh to all this Ukrainian westward movement, EU Europhilia stuff. And so what he does is essentially he invades the Crimea. So the Crimea is this you know, peninsula in the south of Ukraine that juts out into the Black Sea, which has a very high proportion of ethnic Russians and Russian speakers in it. And so you know, 
in a variety of fairly clever military moves in which Russia sort of nominally conceals its role in this, even though everyone knows that there are Russian troops invading the Crimea, Putin invades the Crimea, kicks out the tiny Ukrainian forces in Crimea and annexes it, declares it Russian territory, Russian sovereign territory, this former you know, province of Crimea of Ukraine. At the same time, in the eastern parts of Ukraine, Donetsk and Luhansk, where the, most of the ethnic Russians in Ukraine live and most of the Russian speakers in Ukraine live, uh, Putin foments an anti-Ukrainian pro-Russian ethnic separatist rebellion. Arms, equips, advises, and assists a variety of pro-Russian militias in the eastern part of the country to rise up and declare the independence as new states of Donetsk and Luhansk you know, to carve off significant pieces of Ukraine's territory. The Crimean invasion ends quickly and decisively, produces annexation. There's no more violence in Ukraine. The separatist war in the East, on the other hand, is being waged mostly not by Russian uniformed troops, but by ethnic separatist militias. That war is not as decisive, not as quick, and ends up grinding on and on and on. And it ebbs and it flows and it waxes and it wanes. And right up until February of 2022, there's this kind of slow moving, stalemated ethnic insurgency going on in the eastern part of Ukraine. And all of this is a downstream consequence of a major change in Russian politics when Putin comes into office. And of Putin's attitude towards Ukraine, which part of Putin's brand is reestablish the old Soviet empire. Putin sees Ukraine as rightfully a part of Russia, not an independent country. Uh, so Putin comes into office, he sees his own status threatened by these political uprisings that he sees as American fomented. Uh, he sees Ukraine moving west. He decides he's going to act to stop that. The result is ongoing chronic warfare in the eastern part of Ukraine and Russian conquest of the Crimea. Then in late 2021, Putin decides for a variety of reasons that he wants to ex escalate this conflict and he wants to increase the demands, not just that there be independent states in Donetsk and, Lu Donetsk and Lu Luhansk, but he demands that NATO uh, welch on its agreement to eventually admit Ukraine and declare that Ukraine will never be admitted into NATO. Moreover, he demands that NATO withdraw its troops from the new members of NATO that had joined after 1997. Because Putin has decided that the entire project of NATO expansion is illegitimate and a threat. And he makes a variety of other demands too, but, but the, the principal demands are Ukraine will never become a member of NATO. That is to be announced by NATO. NATO will withdraw all of its troops from its new members. Uh, and Donetsk and Luhansk, of course, will, be, will become independent. And to enforce these demands, he starts moving troops to the border of Ukraine. Now, I think what was going on in this was not that Putin had simply decided that he was going to invade Ukraine, but that he wanted these demands met and he was moving troops to the border to back up his threat, implicitly saying, NATO, Biden, you Westerners, agree to my demands or else. And the or else was this kind of vague threat that you might invade Ukraine with, with this mounting Russian military force being deployed to the borders of Ukraine, which eventually reached something on the order of about 200,000 troops by February of 2022. And throughout this period of, of escalation and mobilization, there's a negotiation going on between Putin and NATO and the Biden administration, in which I think both sides basically wanted a compromise that was not going to be a war. 
But the trouble is Putin kept escalating. When he, so for example, the, the Biden administration's counteroffers tended to be along the lines of, no, we're not going to welch on a promise, right? That's not the way we operate within NATO. But what we will do is we we're, we'll postpone it indefinitely. We won't we'll put it in writing. They'll never join. But they're not going to join anytime soon, believe me. A. B, let's have an arms control negotiation in which maybe NATO will withdraw troops from the new members. But in exchange, Russia will withdraw troops from the Western military districts of Russia. And we will be able to tell the Poles and the Czechs and the other new members, yes, we're withdrawing NATO troops from your countries, but the Russians are also backing away. So there's a big you know, zone in the middle part of Europe where there won't be any significant offensive threats. So we can meet the, the legitimate security demands of the new members and meet your trumped up worries that NATO is going to invade you, Vlad with a mutual agreement to move troops. And you know, Putin wouldn't agree, held to his original demands, and kept sending more troops. And I think what happened was Putin was gradually painting himself into a corner where if he wasn't willing to accept the compromise and instead kept sending more troops, how do you then back down and accept the compromise later and not look like a weakling? All right, Putin's domestic political brand in Russia is he's a strong man looking like a weakling might very well rekindle the same protests that, that were such a problem in 2011. So he refuses to do that and keeps doubling down with sending more and more troops. And finally, in February, he's painted himself into such a small corner. He's deployed such you know, a large military force to the borders of Ukraine, has refused all these offers for so long that I think he just decided he now had no choice except to pull the trigger. I, I don't think he wanted to, I don't think that was the idea when he started this process in November of 2021, but, but that's where he had left himself. There was a tendency before February 2022 among Americans to view Putin as this master strategist, as this kind of strategic genius who was playing three-dimensional chess while we Americans are busy playing tic-tac-toe. Uh, any image that, that Putin is a master strategist looks pretty silly now, but one of the early indications that the man was not a master strategist was the way he boxed himself in on Ukraine prior to the February 22 invasion. So he gets boxed in, launches the invasion, and that then brings us to the question of the Christian ethics of all. Wow, it's 943. I need to move faster, I guess. The history is so fascinating. So, um, the, the quick version of the Christian ethics of this, right, is that the, the most Christian ethicists on issues of war and peace follow one variety or another of, of the just war tradition. And the just war tradition is a response to the tension in Christian ethics between God's desire for justice and God's desire for peace, which in an unjust world are often in tension with each other. And there's plenty of scriptural basis for both of these these tendencies. The, the pacifist tradition in the Christian church emphasizes peace over justice. The crusading tradition in Christian history emphasizes justice over peace. The just war tradition says we're going to try and compromise between these two, and we will admit war is sometimes necessary in a fallen world, but we'll try and restrict its application to the absolute minimum uh, incidents possible. And it does this through a variety of rules that are referred to collectively as uh, uh, use ad bellum, or the justice of the decision to go to war, and use in bello, or the justice of the way you conduct a war. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine fails any normal standard on either of those two, right? The, there are a variety of particular provisions in both of these. But the central provision in use ad bellum, the decision to go to war, is it has to be for a just cause, which is normally defined as self-defense. This was unambiguously not self-defense. There was no meaningful prospect that Ukraine was going to invade Russia. Moreover, the arguments some people have made that NATO expansion was a threat to Russia was not seen that way by Russia until Vladimir Putin, after the vast majority of the expansion had taken place. So I, I, my own view is that there's no legitimate case to be made that this is a justifiable self-defensive invasion of an innocent neighbor by Russia, right? So it, it fails. You said bellum standards. Moreover, the standard, the, the, the central issue for use in bellow is 
uh, non-combatant uh, immunity. You're not supposed to kill innocent civilians unless you absolutely have to. The Russian conduct of the war, by all uh, observable indications, deliberately targets civilians as a coercive tool to pressure the, the Ukrainian government. So the, we, we could go on in Q&A if there's time for it, but this war is fails justice standards on both scores for Russia. And the conduct of the war, although we, we worship a God who loves peace, nevertheless would be interpreted as just, I think, by almost all uh, Christian ethicists. So what, what then about the conduct of the war that has happened just as it is for the Ukrainians, unjust as it is for the Russians? The short version of this is the war is essentially stalemated militarily on the ground and is likely to remain so for many years. Um, 200,000 troops sounds like a lot. And heaven knows Russia is a much bigger, more powerful country than Ukraine. It has three times the population. It has 10 times the GDP. Um, you would think that 200,000 soldiers in uh, fielded by a state as large and powerful as Russia ought to steamroll or Ukraine. 200,000 actually isn't that many. When, when you look at the, the military geography of Ukraine, uh, 200,000 soldiers is radically undersized for the scale of the job Russia cut out for itself when it decided to do this invasion. This, this is a part of the world that has been much fought over. In World War II, there was a lot of warfare, specifically in Ukraine. So just as an illustrative point of comparison, in the, the lviv sandomirs offensive of 1944, the old Soviet Union put into an operating area about collinear with the current borders of Ukraine, a military force of 2 million soldiers, right? 10 times the size of what Russia put into Ukraine in February of 2022. Now, Warfare has changed a lot since 1944. Maybe you don't need that many. Take a more recent example. In 2003, the United States invaded Iraq, a country you know, roughly comparable in population, if, if not in geographic area, to Ukraine, with about the same troop count that the Russians invaded Ukraine with, but on a frontage one-tenth as broad as the one the Russians adopted in, in February. So at the end of the day, the Russians were biting off a lot more than they could chew with the force size that they'd given themselves in this country. And they made a variety of other decisions that, that made their offensive even less effective than it would be otherwise. But first point to keep in mind about the conduct of the war is the Russian force in the country is not big enough to conquer the country if it's going to fight back. Right. Lots of reasons to believe that Russia didn't, Putin didn't think that was going to happen. If you assume Russia, that Ukraine is going to fight back, that force size isn't enough. Secondly, you have to remember that Ukraine is now fully mobilized for war. The, the country had a modest regular military, a couple of hundred thousand at most, but it was backed up by a large semi-trained military reserve, which has now been fully mobilized. Uh, 900,000 reservists were available to Ukraine. And you know, when mobilized, in 2022, and they are now mobilized. So there's good reason to believe that although Russia has a military potential that greatly exceeds Ukraine's, the military actually deployed in Ukraine is probably as big on the Ukrainian side as it is on the Russian side. And the Ukrainian side is increasingly well armed as the West is flowing in what is now about $25 billion a month you know, the half of that's for economic assistance, but call it 10 to 15 billion a month in weapons assistance. So the, the net result of this is a situation in which Russia has been unable to simply conquer the country in military terms. And that's partly a function of just the, the arithmetic of troop size. It's partly a function of what has turned out to be radically lower military proficiency on the part of the Russians than anybody expected. And it's partly a function of some horribly bad strategic decisions that Putin made about how he was gonna conduct the war that were driven largely by an, a faulty assumption that the Ukrainians wouldn't fight back. So if, if the war is now essentially stalemated on the ground, I mean, it, it's very unlikely that, that Putin is gonna conquer Ukraine anytime soon. What, what's the end game for all this? And in particular, what is the prospect that 
as a result of frustration on the ground militarily, Putin decides to escalate as a way of getting out of a military situation on the ground that he can't win by threatening to widen the war as a way of coercing the United States and the West into stopping its assistance to Ukraine. Many people are worried, and I think understandably so, that Putin could escalate initially to conventional attacks on NATO members like Poland, airstrikes or cruise missile strikes against the air bases through which all these arms are flowing into Ukraine, but potentially to the use of nuclear weapons. How does this war end without that happening? Well, it could happen. And if you want something to worry about in the world right now, high on my list of things to worry about would be the danger that this war could escalate. I mean, Putin's tendency, as we saw in his negotiation behavior after November of 2021, is he doesn't compromise, he doubles down. He doesn't give something up, he escalates. If he does that here, that the stakes are literally existential for everyone involved. Russia has a massive nuclear arsenal that's capable of reaching the United States. How might that not happen? And the answer is the only way that doesn't happen that's plausible in the medium term is some kind of negotiated settlement to the war. The Ukrainians cannot win militarily. So there's a lot of enthusiasm in the United States right now for enabling the Ukrainians to win. We shouldn't just accept some compromise settlement. We should enable them to win. After all, they're, they're at the moment gaining ground on net rather than losing it in Ukraine. Let's continue arming them and let's empower them to win. The trouble is Ukraine cannot win unless it marches on Moscow and destroys the Russian military. The only way this war can end is if Russia agrees to end it. Short of Ukraine disarming the Russian military by marching on Moscow and simply destroying it, which is not possible, right? That's not feasible. No matter how much arms and assistance we provide to the Ukrainians, no, Napoleon, Bonaparte, and Hitler didn't manage that, right? Ukraine is not going to march on Moscow and destroy the Russian military. What that means is even if Ukraine restores its pre-war borders, even if it kicks the Russians out of all parts of Ukraine that they now occupy, even if it reconquers Crimea, the war still doesn't end unless Russia agrees to stop shooting. And why would Russia agree to do that? Well, they're, they're not going to agree to do that unless there's some sort of compromise settlement that they view as preferable to just simply continuing to shoot at Ukrainians, even if Ukraine you know, kicks Russians out to the international border. Now, the, the problem with the negotiated settlement at the moment is not that the United States hasn't come up with some clever formula right, for, for what the two sides should compromise on. The, the problem at the moment is twofold, neither of which the United States has much control over. The, the first is Putin. If Putin doesn't agree to a compromise, there is no compromise. And the war just goes on. And all the evidence to date is that Putin has been vetoing compromise proposals that his own foreign ministry has been floating over and over again. So Putin is not willing to compromise. And if he's not willing to compromise, then the war doesn't end. The, the other part of the problem, of course, is that the Ukrainians have to agree to compromise. <laughs> Vladimir, Zelen Vladimir Zelensky has to agree to a compromise in which Russia gets something probably that it didn't have in February 22, and certainly that it didn't have in you know, 2014. Uh, and if Zelensky agreed to any large scale compromise right now, Zelensky would be overthrown in a coup d'etat because the fury among Ukrainians at Russia knows no bounds. So given that, there's nothing that Joe Biden can say that's gonna end this war. The war is gonna grind on in a mutually costly stalemate, probably for years, that stalemate could end with Russian escalation, but so far it looks like Putin understands that escalation would hurt him more than a stalemate would. Right? In, in technical military terms, the United States has escalation dominance. We're militarily superior at each rung of the escalation ladder. And although Putin could threaten escalation as a way of saying, I'm going to blow up the world unless you give me what I want, so give me what I want. So far, 
it looks like Putin has decided that he's not willing to blow up the world to get what he wants. What that means is that probably there's going to be several years of mutually hurting stalemate in this war until such time as both Putin and the Ukrainians decide that they're willing to settle the war with some kind of a compromise. And that's not on the horizon at the moment. There's no imaginable compromise that both sides would currently agree to, A. B, this isn't in the United States' power to affect because we can't you know, do anything other than impose pain through the war in Ukraine on Putin to get Putin to eventually decide to compromise. That, that's Putin's decision to make. And he's not making it right now. So the net result is we're all trapped in this war. And we're trapped in this war until Putin changes his mind. And that probably is going to take a while. Um, I'm going on longer than I intended. Uh, and I, I want some time for Q&A. Why, why don't I stop transmitting at this point? And let's talk about whatever aspects of this are of most interest to you folks. Steve, I have a question. Sure. What, what of regime change? I mean, isn't the simple answer take out Putin? I mean, and to me, that is just war theory compromise. Because as you said, okay, I don't think he's willing to blow up the whole world to get what he wants. I don't think the rest of the world is willing to let him get what he wants without blowing him up first. That's kind of where I think. I mean, when you've got Switzerland, who has never come down on any other war ever before, come down on him, say, hey, this is bad. I think we're dealing with something that it, it comes down to regime change. And I guess my, you know, this, so sort of the passionate part of me, but the, the smart guy in me says, what does that mean? If we did that, what does that look like? Yeah, the Biden administration is very interested in regime change and it leaks out occasionally in, in unguarded moments when Biden says things like Putin must go. Um, the problem with it is at least twofold. The, the, the first and immediate problem is how do you do it? Right, so the, Putin is, very concerned with regime change. I mean, Putin's whole policy towards Ukraine is dominated by concern with regime change. Therefore, Putin and before him Medvedev, right, and, and before him, you know, the, the previous leadership in Russia have been worried enough about coup d'etat that they have systematically coup-proofed the, the Russian regime. The senior leadership and the military and the intelligence service are hand-picked cronies. There are multiple intelligence services that keep an eye on each other. The military chain of command is kept divided and all communications have to go through Moscow so that it's very hard for military leaders to communicate directly with each other. The intelligence service has made it clear that they will punish coup conspiracies with death. I mean, there's a collection of techniques that political scientists refer to as coup proofing that autocrats have adopted worldwide over the last couple of generations that tend to be very effective at making coups very hard to bring about, even with outside support. And, you know, Putin is sitting in an extremely aggressively coup-proofed government. And, and just as an illustration of the scale of this problem, remember, coup threatening is uh, punishable by death in places like this. So if you're a Russian general and you're thinking, you know, it would be swell if somebody other than Putin were running this place, if, if you're going to talk about that to another general, you're taking a risk that you could be hanging from the end of a noose by noon of the next day if that other general rats you out. So there are tremendous problems with what political scientists call collective action, right? How do enough people trust each other that they're not informants to engage in an illegal conversation against the, the penalty of potential death to build a large enough conspiracy that you can overcome Putin's Praetorian guards and actually get the man killed. 
I, I think the odds of a coup d'etat are very low until and unless Putin meaningfully threatens nuclear war. My, my own view is the only thing that could overcome the collective action dilemma that prevents coup d'etat in Moscow is if Putin is deliberately, is, is plausibly, credibly, immediately threatening nuclear war. Right now, the average Russian general thinks, if I stay silent, I keep living and my family has a nice lifestyle. If I speak up, I die and my family gets thrown in jail. Losing this war won't change any of those things. A nuclear war changes those things, right? If, if Putin drags Russia into a nuclear war, every senior leader in Russia is going to lose everything. So my, my guess is that if, if you get a coup threat, it's likely to come in the out years because Putin decides not to continue tolerating a stalemate, but to escalate. Short of that, I don't see a coup d'etat as likely. Second, even if a coup happens, he's not going to be replaced by George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. Right? If, if Putin falls, he's in all likelihood going to be replaced by a more virulent, virulent nationalist than he is. So the, the likelihood that Putin's replacement would be a pro-Western Democrat in this environment is very low. I mean, the United States has a lot of experience with regime change since 2001. We're, we're world experts in its consequences. And so far, its consequences have been pretty uniformly negative. When we topple a government, even one as autocratic as Saddam's Bathist regime or the Taliban uh, theocracy in Kabul, it tends not to be replaced by strong, capable governments that can act in accordance with, with US preferences. You, you get something like chaos. So for all those reasons, I, th I think regime change might or might not end the war, depending on who replaces Putin. But regime change isn't very likely, certainly in the next couple of years. That, that's why I think stalemate is probably where we're headed rather than regime change, much as it would be nice if, it, if Putin got replaced by somebody who would end the war. It's getting to that time that I think we're going to have to close down. But once again, I think we've had a terrific hour presentation with Dr. Steve Biddle. And, and if you don't mind, would you close us with prayer, please? Good and gracious God, as we leave this place, proceed to the sanctuary for worship and proceed out of the church and into our lives, be with us. Grant us your wisdom, grant us your strength. Help us to be the body of Christ in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.